houses are quite prominent um, at the moment, but some of the things that we probably became most known for was our multiple housing um, quite a few years ago. And only, I'm only just going to sort of skip over, I just thought I'd throw it in there. But, I mean, one of the things about that multiple housing, at the time that we started doing it, it was very much that, that multiple housing had to be sort of fragmented. That was all sort of pushed through the planning department. That all had to be about individuality. And we actually felt it was about the collective, that it was very important, it was important for these larger objects to, to say something to the city uh, rather than being necessarily about individual um, expression. And so we did approach, this is a little tiny little project years ago, it was one of our first projects really. Three little row houses, but tiny little houses, but we tied them together in this kind of single, single gesture which actually created an urbanism in, of itself. And there were sort of three subsequent projects of that. One was the middle one there is a Department of Housing project. Women's uh, Refuge Housing. And the bottom one below is some houses in Pran um, that we did with ten, a group of ten people. Where we actually live. We still live there. Um, and um, that, that's the view directly opposite uh, the building. So you can see, because of the elong nat nature of, elongated nature of the sites in Melbourne, uh, what happened in the 60s where all these sort of six-pack buildings were built because they they're effectively rotated townhouses because the town the townhouse type didn't suit the subdivision that uh, Melbourne had been given. So the rotated townhouse, which is essentially the six-pack, became the type of the 60s. But since then, or sometime after that, it's, it's basically had a bad name. It's been considered to be very poor housing um, when in some respects it's actually quite good multiple housing I mean, some of the things that are wrong with it, I guess, are orientation. That is, it doesn't deal well with its orientation. And it also tends to, uh, I, I guess, make the sort of driveway area uh, not, not an area of quality. Like, it doesn't actually see the driveway as a street. And what we tried to do with this building was to think of the driveway, the bit along the side that you use to access the buildings, as being like uh, an important street in and of itself something about the idea of kind of disguising the object or, or using a material like concrete. With A lot of people say, well, concrete should be you know, about honesty. And we think that concrete, well, concrete can be whatever you want it to be. It's a plastic material, effectively. Yeah, our children call it the unmade bed. And this is, we didn't know about this architect, um, Miguel Fizak, but um, someone bought a book sometime later and said, look at this, you copied it. But, um, you know, he had the same idea, so all this sort of way that you could mould concrete, um, which, you know, I think is kind of fascinating. And the other thing about the building was uh, the sort of complexity of planning, actually trying to get the sort of complex locking of uh, different plan types to basically increase the amenity of um, each individual apartment. So there was a sort of purple one which had a living room on top. There was the green one which had basically living on the bottom and there was a sort of a shared bedroom zone and they interlocked together. The apartment type. And the, that's the type of the living on the bottom. And then using the front setback as a sort of semi-private collective space. And it was really that building that uh, gave us this introduction to larger buildings, the QB2 building, um, which we were invited by um, Grocon to work on. Um, and I've coupled this with another house that we did in Turak because even though they're completely different types, I think it's interesting, the relationship, they were done at the same time and there's a kind of an interesting kind of relationship between the two of them, which shows you it isn't necessarily about size or type uh, that ideas can somehow kind of run across both. And just even in the look of the two, you know, there's, there's an obvious affinity. Firstly, the QV2 apartment building. It's within, it's on Swanson Street, so you've got the city grid, Swanson Street's the main ceremonial access that runs through the middle of, um, of the grid. Uh, on one end, it's got the, um, uh, the Shrine of Rese Re Resemblance. Remembrance. I was going to say. <laughs> um, and then the other was the old CUB site. And uh, this is probably Melbourne's most important open space, which is the, is the open space out the front of the State Library. So we were petrified when we first got this project. We put our hand up for it. We had to choose one on the site, and we said this one because it was the smallest, so we thought we'd get it. But, we might um, have a better chance of getting it. But, um, yeah, we figured if we got this wrong, we'd probably have to move to Sydney. Um, and it was basically built over a podium, so there was sort of architect for, for doing the sort of podium area, the retail area, 
And even though the other architects talked all about going to the street and how important it was to take the same expression to the street, we took the opposite and we said, no, nah, no, nah, we just stick it on a podium because we quite like that model. And it had this sort of nice relationship with kind of Rem Coolhouse's City of the Captive Globe. And it was really a kind of a sensible thing to do as well by changing the structural grid from the um, car park grid we allowed for more efficiency in the apartments uh, and a simpler form of construction and, uh, and allowed the, sp the um, form to free up. So we could actually free the form and play with it a bit. And we had this... Um, we, we saw lots of apartments as being almost like sort of shrunk, you know, two-bedroom brick Housing. veneers or something. Mm -hmm. They're just sort of taken down. And we were sort of interested in trying to explore a new type. So the new type was a sort of centrally... Central, the apartment with the sort of central core in it uh, where the apartment skin was sort of wrapped around that core. And it seemed to have a sort of, sort of efficiency and logic and servicing. It has that lineage with uh, things like the Farnsworth House. Um, and we spent many, many hours trying to kind of get the engineers to just keep their pipes within that one central core, which is quite difficult, but we got there in the end. Um, it started off as this idea of a sort of kit apart, so we wanted each one to be different, so 17 different apartments, which the idea was that they distorted, and as they distorted, the, the parts in the middle kind of moved. Um, something like in a kind of alto apartment where it's the one type and it sort of distorts to... To, to suit the um, suit the orientation, um, and also we had to get around a central uh, car park exhaust, which was right in the middle. The build, the, the apartments on the top are to the north, so they look over the uh, State Library, sort of beautiful outlook, but they also are, have sort of fantastic orientation. The ones on the south, partly shaping it up, was to try and get light from the east and west, to try and get some oblique uh, and, views. And on the bottom of the floor, that was just a. Um, an office building, and it was partly about pulling it away from that office building as much as we could as well. The building, and this goes back to those other buildings, um, the thought was that this building was a sort of... It was really part of the city. It wasn't so much to do with the sort of individual apartment owner. And so it was almost like it was a public building. It was an incredibly public space. So we tried to kind of tie it back to that, that sort of sense uh, of a kind of important public building just in simple techniques of trying to hide all the stuff that you'd have on your balcony, but also in the kind of polished stone, using concrete and polishing it to give that sense of polished stone. And it also acts as a sort of end to that educational precinct of RMIT running up and then sort of start of the commercial precinct. The building sort of plays with, you know, Melbourne has these sort of secondary uh, laneways, so it plays with the idea of that. And then on the left-hand side, that's the sort of new laneways, which the QV... Uh, development was all about creating new Melbourne laneways. And then the sort of other task was the kind of individual amenity. So, um, you know, basically sort of a simple technique of taking these sort of four Coburn uh, tapestries, which is basically the four seasons, uh, and applying them to the central core and thinking of the core almost being like a sort of art object. It's about uh, getting maximum diversity for minimum cost. So that you could have, um, yeah, the four different apartments, sorry, four different colour schemes by the 17 apartments gives you 63 different types, potentially. So diversity within the single object. And these are just some of the... That's the sort of basic... That's the type we started with, um, which is a very sort of simple square. And then on the south side, the more distorted types, which actually ended up being the most interesting of the apartments. I mean, the, uh, we had to consult with real estate agents um, and they basically said that spring was the only one that was going to sell because it was the most beige, but it's actually not what happened. It was sort of a completely even spread. Um, yeah, the more colourful ones did sell as well, so we sort of dispelled that myth. Yeah, the agents in Melbourne, they have a tendency of... You have your colour schemes done by the architect and then they have another colour scheme that they do. But we figured they couldn't invent a new season, so... 